All right, looks like we're recording. So I want to thank everybody for uh, coming back this Friday afternoon and being here for this presentation. I'm not going to say a whole lot, but I do want to introduce Mr. George Lee, our speaker for this, for, uh, uh, this afternoon's talk. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, unconscious bias and racism. And uh, a little bit about George. I think we've known each other for uh, maybe 10, 10, 10, 10 years, maybe 10, 15 years or something like that. Um, and uh, we were on the OU debate team together and became good friends at, uh, at our time at OU. And uh, uh, since then, George has gone on to uh, have a lot of success in the world of college debate. Uh, and he's also gone on to... Uh, uh, become a really successful academic and higher education professional. Uh, he really emphasizes in talking about issues in human relations and uh, social difference. Uh, he gets uh, a lot of requests to talk about uh, racism, white supremacy, patriarchy, uh, implicit bias, uh, incivility, um, really kind of a whole host of topics. Uh, so today we're going to have him talking about unconscious bias and racism. I think he'll, uh, you know, kind of uh, tailor that to uh, this group being new students. And so uh, with that, I just wanted to say welcome. And I guess I'll pass it over to George to get started. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, like you said, my name is uh, George Lee, but I'll give you out the official, you know, how I usually do it. You know, I'm on, I'm on social media everywhere, right? This is how I usually do it. This is your boy, George Lee, a.k.a. Conscious Lee. Don't forget the Lee. You can catch me at georgeleespeaks.com for all booking, all merchandise, you know. Um, today, we, today, today we're here to explore a particular topic. My motto is education is elevation. And today we're going to be exploring the unconscious consciousness of racism. And in this conversation about the unconscious consciousness of racism, um, I recognize that we have first year students. I recognize that um, a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about is not very unknown to y'all whereas i know i'm talking to young adults and regardless of how conservative liberal white mixed black native you come from the areas you come from i'm sure you had experiences of hearing about everything we're about to get into today without further ado though we're gonna be jumping into this little powerpoint bam the unconscious consciousness of racism. Um, I want to just let everybody know throughout this throughout this presentation, um, I'm here for y'all. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, I even like jokes too. You feel me? So if you got those, I'm definitely open to hearing those. Um, I do recognize I'm a bit of a fast speaker. Like Paul said, um, I have a policy debate background. And sometimes us debaters have a little bit of tendency to get passionate and get burped up and start talking very fast. <laughs> so I'm going to try not to do that with y'all. Um, but if I do, if, if, if you find yourself kind of not being able to understand what I'm talking about or something that I said, you know, you're not really familiar with, I encourage you to please ask a question. That being said, um, here's just some challenges that I face when putting together this workshop and I'm actually giving y'all a workshop that I put together for the faculty and staff at the University of Oklahoma, where I am one of the diversity and inclusion uh, facility trainers. Uh, so there were some, so there were a range of potential approaches that I could have taken in terms of talking about the unconscious consciousness of racism. See, there's an absence of any real standardization and agreement within the intellectual community of color, and not only the intellectual community of color on campus, but also within the academy on what all we know and what all we believe to be unequivocally true about racism. What this means is there is no one size fit all. And what I learned from being a debater is there is no universal approach to take to any subject, especially when it comes to talking about race and racism. People's understanding of racism and, and its meaning is culturally specific with their variations within every group. I recognize that every single one of y'all in every one of these groups, whether you in the cadets, whether you in the bushies, whether you in the first, whatever group you is, whether you're watching this, the video, after the fact. I recognize that you come from a particular cultural background that has particular specific cultural implications and understandings when it comes to talking about race and racism. When it comes to us getting into what we're about to get into, I'm not asking you to divorce yourself from those experiences. I'm asking yourself to filter everything we're about to get into based off of your experiences you've had in this world. And I recognize that we all have different experiences, myself included. 
We also, I also realized that I didn't want to go too soft and accidentally slide into this trap of treating the unlearning racism or the unconscious conscious racism as just a simple diversity training where I give y'all little cookie cutter prefix elementary things like treat others how you want to be treated and you know what I'm saying, uh, uh, all these kind of things that we learned back in grade school. So while I'm tied to the idea of this uh, workshop being, uh, being a workshop and sharing ideas in a sense, I also realized that if people were starting in different points, with some real, I mean, I mean, with no real knowledge of a thing, while others have significant knowledge, they would try to, they would kind of make the conversation a little bit uh, more difficult to be had. And with that acknowledging, I want to recognize that we're about to have a difficult conversation. And with difficult conversations, we have to be very purposeful and intentional with what we're doing and what we're doing it for. Today, I'm asking each and one of y'all, each and every one of y'all to embrace the education of discomfort. Because finally, this is finally this is uncritical, uh, uncomfortable work. We want to. I want to remind y'all that unsettling the waters of your own racist assumptions is uncomfortable work. Some of you may find yourself bored, annoyed, angry, pissed off, encouraged, possibly even you know uh, empowered by something that I say. However, I want you to recognize that discomfort rather than confusion is always a good takeaway as long as there's a clarity about what the discomfort or anger is about. I'm asking you to step out of your comfort zone and being able to talk about always already how you can be comfortable in having these hard conversations about race and racism. And then I wanted to throw in my little disclaimer, you know what I'm saying, Robert State University, because I want to be real. Yeah, I figured it out. I like, to, I like to be straightforward, you feel me? I'm an African-American male that is from the west side of Bryan College Station, Texas. Shout out to everybody on west side, you feel me? What I, what, I, what I know in terms of having racial dialogue is that I've been conditioned as a black man to always already prioritize how my words make white people feel comfortable or uncomfortable. White people, this is specifically to you. This conversation will not be had in a way that prioritizes the comfort zone of whiteness or white people. As we start to go throughout this workshop and I get to my learning objectives, it will become more clear. And if I recognize that it might be very cringy for me to say this very straightforward the way I am right now. By the end of this workshop, it is, if it is not clear why I have given you this disclaimer, please, please, please say, George, Remember at the beginning of the workshop, we don't understand what that whole little rant you gave about the comfort zone, what it was about. Like, well, I don't understand. And, I, and, I, and I'll make sure that's understood. What we're here for, we have these four goals and objectives that we're going to be trying to get into. We're going to workshop around our understanding of racism. We're going to learn and challenge each other in terms of how we have these parameters and thinking about race and racism. We're going to discuss some examples of race-related situations specific to the university context. And then last, we're going to speculate about different strategies of policies and procedures that can improve the college environment as it relates to issues of racism. And again, what I recognize is y'all first-year students. So what I'm going to ask y'all is to think about, uh, uh, think about being high school alumni and how you, going through the hallways of the high school you went through, what, what would you be able to tell the administrators of the, of, the, of the school that you went to in terms of how it is situated within race and racism? Now we're gonna get into our first little activity. You know, when it comes to doing these workshops, I know that in the beginning of it, it's about getting your mind moving, you feel me? So right now I want y'all to take out a piece of paper and write down three things. Don't worry, this piece of paper, you ain't gotta share it with nobody. It's just for us, you know what I'm saying? I want you to write down three things on this piece of paper. I, wanna write, I want you to write down your definition of racism. And when I say your definition of racism, I'm talking about in your words. Not Wikipedia, not, you know, not, not none of that. I want to know your definition of racism as it relates to what's going on right now. Second, I want to know as it relates to racism, what do you find people, what, what do you see people doing that you, want them to, that you want them to unlearn? And what do you want to unlearn? That's the last thing. I'll give y'all like just two minutes to just uh, very, very, very briefly kind of go over, over, write those things down, a few minutes.
I am out. Can, can y'all hear me? Yes. All right, good. All right, cool. Cool. Yeah, yeah about one more minute. Your definition of racism as it relates to racism, what do you want people to unlearn? And then lastly, what do you want to unlearn about racism? So if we can hear you, I had a question about your Korean background. Oh yeah, I forgot to do it. And as y'all finish that up, actually, at first I wasn't going to do this activity, but I actually want to take about five minutes to get this activity kind of, kind of see what we got, man. Next, we're about to get into the stereotypes activity. Before I get into like the, 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 the mini lecturettes in terms of me getting more deeper about those learning objectives, I first kind of want y'all to start kind of giving us a little bit of the material that we're going to be working from. So y'all already in groups pretty much. So I'm just gonna give each group, I'm gonna assign y'all a demographic. And in this demographic, uh, uh, in your group, I want you to think about all the dominant mainstream and media stereotypes that's associated with the demographic that you're assigned to. You can have one person in the group just have a, a list to just write down these, these different stereotypes. And please, please, please be honest. This is not a reflection of your personal views. I'm asking you to write down specific things you've been told about these demographics based off of media, based off of music, based off of history, based off of movies, based off of TV shows, uh, what you heard from back in the day, what you see on your timeline. That's what I'm going to be asking you in terms of in your groups being real with yourselves in terms of giving us this list. Y'all ready? You can just do the reactions now. I've been, I've been teaching on Zoom all, all summer now because I forgot to, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, I'm also a professor at the University of Oklahoma. Um, I'm a debate coach at the University of Oklahoma. I'm the uh, assistant debate director at the University of Oklahoma. And then in the summertime, I usually do a lot of teaching in terms of argumentation and actually doing these workshops. So we got Bushy Heads is ready. Bam. So this is what I'm about to do. Uh, bushy Heads, I'm going to sign y'all white women. What are stereotypes about white women? What are y'all told about white women? You know, politically, socially, economically, what are stereotypes about white women? Uh, hilltoppers. I'm going to give y'all Native American men. Native American men stereotypes about Native American men. So go down. See, lone soldiers. I'm going to give you Mexican women. Mexican women, what are stereotypes that you have heard, talked about, I mean, have seen, came across since you've been alive about Mexican women? All right, next group, see the uh, diamonds. I'm going to give y'all uh, African American men, uh, gold domes. I'm going to give y'all Asian women. Uh, who are the group I don't have yet? See, if I get long, story, long, long soldiers, uh, what group is y'all right here? Uh, I can't see what it is. Oh, 
Cadets. Cadets. I'm sorry, Cadets. I, I was, I'm trying to click on y'all names so they can show me. And for some reason, you know, Zoom got me over here looking like a, a, a goofy person. But uh, Cadets, we're going to give y'all white men. And you said blue stars. Did you say blue stars? Yeah. And uh, let's go. I said Native Americans and Mexican. Let's go with uh, Middle Eastern women. Is it, does everybody have a, 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 a um, um, uh, an assignment now? And let's just take three minutes, you know what I'm saying? Like, what does Fox News, CNN, MSNBC say about these groups of people? You know, when you listen to your rap, your country, your blues, your, 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 your reggae, your, your pop music, what does it tell you about these groups of people? The group of person that you, the, the person that you, the, the group of people that you got, the demographic you got. When you think about history, politically, socially, economically, what have you been told about that specific demographic? And keep it real with me too. Your mama ain't here, your, 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 you know what I'm saying? Your, your daddy ain't here, you feel me? Your pastor not here. Be real with me and be real with yourself when y'all writing this down. Be honest. What are these stereotypes? And I, and I and I ain't really this. I feel like I just had this, this spontaneous feeling in the moment. So, I, so I'm just gonna give y'all like a minute or two left. I still got other stuff I gotta get to. I just realized y'all already in groups. It's like, why not do this activity that I make the, the faculty and staff and administration at the University of Oklahoma conduct? Why, why not y'all do this? You know? So I'm just gonna give you about, you know, a few more, a few more seconds, literally. And I just want a few groups to be able to go. We won't, I think we won't have time for every group to go, but you know, we, I just want at least three groups to go. To I mean, and we're gonna get to this next lecture with using what we what we've kind of developed and talking about stereotypes. So when there's a group that is prepared to run down their list for the rest of us, you can pick a spokesperson. <laughs> I'm sorry, but pick a spokesperson and you know give us that list. You don't have to keep the, cut the camera on. You can keep the, I mean, you can get the camera off. Just cut your mic on. We'll go first if you're ready. Let's hear it. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, make sure you repeat the, uh, make sure you tell everybody what group that you had. Okay. So we had white men. And so we said that they, the stereotypes were wealthy, powerful, educated, always right, approachable, threatening, school shooters, can't dance, privileged, Christian, or they have a frat boy kind of thing where they are like related to rape culture. Okay. Definitely. Next group. Uh, we'll go next if that's okay. Oh yeah, go. Okay, so we had uh, African American men. So uh, we had athletic, uh, rappers, dangerous, scary, Undedicated fathers, hardworking, blue collar worker, and crime. Right, right. Can we can we get one more group to go, and preferably a group that has a woman demographic? We're ready. Right. The girl gender yes. demographic. We can go. We have Middle Eastern women. Um, and we picture them wearing jobs. They're typically modest, typically less free or less rights than men. Um, quiet, timid, could be labeled as a, a terrorist, and typically labeled as Muslim. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, we had Hispanic women. We could talk about them if you want. Oh yeah, and and, and then and then uh, for the group that has Hispanic women, after you give us this list of the rundown. I want you to answer either, I want you to answer question two or answer in question three. One of those questions, answer that question after you, in, in, in relationship to Hispanic women, to hearing these okay. statements. Um, yeah, we, we said that some of the stereotypes for Hispanic women, women um, was that they were hard workers, um, that they were strict, family oriented, um, often religious, 
um, but that they were also um, maybe they were just loud or passionate or emotional. Okay. So a takeaway that we had um, after we, we listed the stereotypes was just thinking of how um, how much of a generalization it is to say that an entire people group fits a few adjectives. It seems like a, an insane understatement um, is what we said. Agreed. Agreed, agreed, agreed. So let's just unpackage this little stereotypes activity we just did, right? A takeaway from all these stereotypes is to recognize they don't, uh, uh, they all come from our heads. Whether we believe them or not, they are part of the background noise that we've acquired. You know what I'm saying? What I recognize when I do this workshop, specifically this activity right here, is that when I'm doing this activity with a lot of my colleagues at the University of Oklahoma, sometimes I work with people that come from, uh, uh, that come from Europe or that come from Africa or that come from, I'm going to stick with Europe, right? And what I recognize is that there is a lot of different groups that we just went through and named that uh, maybe a different, dif different people in the European countries don't really have engagement or interaction with. What I always think about in terms of this first takeaway about these stereotypes being in our head is that I had one time I had a, a colleague of mine that was from Yugoslavia and the group that she was in got African-American women. women. And what she said to me was about, and what she had to do when I gave them their assignments, tell them to kind of go and start walking, she came up to me and let me know that being from Yugoslavia, she didn't really have a reference or she didn't really know much about black women. And I told her, so no, like what, what? Like, no, they said, she said, the only thing I know about African-American women is what I've seen from movies in the States. And I said, that's enough. You can write about that. And what she was able to come up with was all these stereotypes about black women being loud and angry and sassy and all these things. And we've seen that even if we don't know where these stereotypes come from, even if we don't believe in them, they still have some background noise in our heads. And this is usually, and our second takeaway is that usually stereotypes have an element to truth in them. However, they become dangerous when they usually have no contextualization or no historical context to how they're being applied to a, to a specific group. For instance, it is a stereotype that African Americans cannot read. However, we know that there is a historical context to the reality of African Americans or enslaved Africans being criminalized and being kind of beaten and brutalized for being able to read or having the desire to read. Or we think about the idea of citizenship in terms of how citizenship is weaponized against particular Mexican or Latino populations. And we think about the, the, the context of exaggeration. And this is when we get to the third takeaway. We know that these stereotypes don't come out the ground. You feel me? Like they don't come out the sky. You know what I'm saying? Like they don't just come out of a random plant or a random tree from the ground. They don't just come out of rain from the sky. They come from somewhere. They become the unconscious backdrop if we don't have any other context for interacting with a larger cross section of demographics. In this sense, white people, which y'all illustrated when y'all was giving me, even though only four groups went, I think what should have been illustrated based off of rhetoric and language is how there's a particular difference in how stereotypes operate with white people. Now, what I want to be clear in what I'm saying is that what we see is that white people also, like everyone else, deal with stereotypes. What should have been evident is that when that first group went talking about white men specifically, there was a lot of what I'm going to call transcendence in the stereotypes that was talked about in terms of white men. And this is why I sprinkle some of my little debate knowledge in here, right? Uh, being a little bit, having a little bit of philosophy background in debate, we talk about transcendence and facticity. Transcendence being what is, facticity being what known, what is known to be. And what we can see even through stereotypes is that white people, particularly white men, usually are given a level of transcendence in order, meaning you can be what you, be, you are what you are, you be what you be, in terms of transcendence compared to facticity and all those other demographics that we named. Um, like, I've, like I've mentioned, you know, I'm an African-American male. Um, I teach at the University of Oklahoma. Being an African-American male at the University of Oklahoma, my body is stuck in a factitial state. I said facticity is what is known to be. 
facticity is, you know what I'm saying, and what I'm known to be on campus is maybe a, a athlete, a football player, a basketball player, track. I'm six one, I got dreads, black, you know. In terms of facticity and transcendence and stereotypes, what it says is that particularly these bodies are seen as this. These bodies are known to be X. But I know they'll be wild if I went to random white people on a university campus and I asked them, are they police officers or doctors or lawyers? It would be random. It's like, why are you asking me that? And this is where, you know, um, I didn't give, I, I didn't get that disclaimer. I like to get here too. Um, I do recognize that my uh, communication style, my presentation style is gonna be a little bit different to a lot of people that's, uh, that's viewing this workshop right here. And there's two tools that I like to deploy, right? The first tool I like to deploy is what I call purposeful provocativeness. Meaning I recognize that to a lot of people, I'm gonna come off provocative. You know, I'm gonna come off as being, you know, a uh, 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 very, very kind of structured with madness a bit, you know? But there's purpose to the provocativeness, there's a method to the badness, just trust me with this one. The reason why I'm giving y'all this disclaimer is because now we finna get into a little bit of the provocativeness. The provocativeness is part of a tool of education, you feel me? This is how we get people to think deeply and critically about some things they've been taught about and things they've been surrounded by their whole entire life. Me, I'm into meme education, you know what I'm saying? I'm one of them stereotypical millennials, you know what I mean? And uh, I'm recording this for my people on Patreon, so I'm just gonna make sure I show the people on Patreon this, this, uh, this, 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 this meme we have right here, you know? And what I recognize in terms of meme education is that in our age of mass information, there's a whole bunch of memes and miseducation being shared in terms of social media, you feel me? A lot of people are misinformed between what a t what, what, what's, what's in a meme. And the reason why I call it meme education is because you are able to kind of go and do some research to see is this meme correct or is it a lie? Based off of you doing a little research, that's why I call it meme education, feel me? Usually, if I wasn't doing this virtually, I would have stood my body and right in front of this, uh, uh, right in front of the meme, and I would have just said before I read this meme, white people, I want you to know that when I say white privilege, I want you to recognize that I'm not saying that you was born with a silver spoon in your mouth. You feel me? When I say white privilege, this does not mean you ain't never been through nothing. When I say white privilege, this does not mean that white people don't face trials and tribulations. When I say white privilege, this doesn't mean that white people can't experience classism, sexism, ableism, patriarchy. White privilege does not mean your life hasn't been hard. It means that your skin color is not one of the things making it harder. When it comes to thinking about stereotypes, we can see how the, the concept of white privilege impacts how stereotypes function, how they are developed, and how they are deployed on particular bodies. Now, in this workshop, my style will be, in terms of introducing these terms, I want to give you context first, and then I'll give you the definition. I gave you the context. White privilege does not mean that your life hasn't been hard. I'm from Bryan College Station, Texas. I'm from the country. I grew up with a whole bunch of poor white people that was poor, just like me. However, them being poor and white does not have the same stigmatization on their skin as it did mine. I, I was raised in a trailer park in Bryan, Texas, you feel me? And in Bryan, Texas, when I walked with my white poor friends into a convenience store, my body was seen as being criminal and being likely seen to be stealing and not their body. We both were poor. White privilege does not deny white people have struggles. White privilege is literally exposed and or literally emphasized and literally taken, in, taken into, into account how white people don't struggle, in fact, because they are white. So some of you might be asking yourself, well, what the hell is white privilege anyway? Like, what do you mean by that, you know? White privilege is the level of societal advantage that comes with, seen, with being seen as the norm in America, automatically conferred irrespective of wealth, gender, ability, sexuality, and other factors. That's what white privilege is. White privilege is the ability not to be suspected, therefore be detected, but therefore be punished. But you know, 
I recognize that terms like white privilege, especially in the racial climate that we live in right now, in the wake of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Tony McDade and all these black people that's been murdered, terms like white privilege kind of set some folks off and piss some folks off. So just to make sure y'all know I'm not just trying to be on some, uh, what I, you know, for lack of better terms, you feel me? I apologize. I was trying to use too much vanity. I try to make this, you know what I'm saying? But I, I want you to feel what I'm saying. Not trying to be on no liberal bipartisan bullshit. When I say white privilege, it has real life impacts to material reality, real lived experiences. And to make sure y'all feel me when I say that, I'm gonna contextualize what I'm talking about with using a study. You know, my motto is facts over feelings. Consider this joy, consider this study from Georgetown about the representations of whites in elite institutions. Because a lot of y'all might be asking, man, you gave us that old broad, vague definition of white privilege, and you gave us some cool examples that might fit, but show us how can you, show us what white privilege means in terms of education. Mr. Education is elevation. Okay, although African-Americans and Hispanics participation in higher education has been growing faster than white students, the report found that whites are overrepresented in the nation's 468 most selective and well-funded colleges and are increasingly vacating the less selective open access to the four-year colleges, which admit a majority of their applicants. On the other hand, though, African-American and Hispanic students are concentrated at 3,250 of these open access colleges. A lot of y'all might be asking yourself, man, what the hell does that long, long quote mean? The part that is bolded. Whites are overrepresented in the nation's 468 most selective and well-funded colleges. Now, if I wasn't doing this virtual, you know, I would, I would, I would take a little rhetorical second to pause, silence, you know. Then I would ask y'all a question. And usually I would ask the question, is a show of hands who would say that the public school, the public public education system in America sucks. Usually my colleagues, the administration and faculty, you know what I'm saying, staff at whatever university, whatever group organization I am at at that time, they were right. Most of them would raise their hand and say, yes, George, you are correct. The public school system sucks. Most of them, most people agree. Then the second question I ask is, are all colors of students implicated within public schools of education. Are black students and white students and native students and Mexican students and Latino students and Asian students implicated within the public school system? And most of the people would raise their hand and say yes. <laughs> Where's my point? Cross-culturally is always is an understanding that the white way is usually the right way. Or how most people said in, the, in many communities of color, if it ain't white, it ain't right. So still sticking with this Georgetown study, you know, the report also says that country, that, that this country's higher education system does not treat students equally, regardless of their qualifications, regardless of their qualifications. Remember, I asked the question, does the public education school system suck right now? It's underfunded. Most people raise their hand, yeah. Then I asked the second question, isn't all demographics of racism? implicated or go through public, public schools? They say yes. This is why this is important. Although many minorities are unprepared for colleges, whites who are just, un as, just as unprepared are still presented with more opportunities and are more likely to receive a bachelor's degree as this Georgetown report says. What does this mean for the students at Rider State University, man? You know, my social media name is Conscious Lee. I like consciousness, you know what I'm saying? I like to try to develop and build consciousness. When y'all are walking through the campus, the beautiful campus, what I'm saying might I add, of Rogers State University, I want you to think about the demographics of people that's represented at Rogers State University. I also want you to think about what demographics is not really being represented at the Rogers State University and what demographics is lacking. Then I want you to ask the question, why they ain't there? Why they ain't there? See, at the University of Oklahoma, I know that the school, the kids in uh, Enid, 
you know, the public school system in Enid is, they, you know what I mean, they're getting the same type of funding they're getting, you know what I'm saying, on that side of Oklahoma City, that side of Tulsa. However, when it comes to preparedness and readiness, we see that it is being weaponized against particular students that come from one district in the public school setting and not being done in the other. What does white privilege look like in the higher education? And see, I recognize, you feel me, you know, that when I'm talking to, 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 to groups of people, especially when they groups of white people, especially about white privilege, you know, it usually triggers a phenomenon, another phenomenon that starts with the word white, you know. This phenomenon is the phenomenon of white privilege. I am 100% sure that if y'all was to show any of this footage to anybody on Fox News, they'll lose their shit and say, this is why we shouldn't be sending our kids to these liberal hotbeds. They had people like George Lee, the race baiter, race conscious race, whatever the hell he calls himself to say that he's a victim and blame white people and target white people, this, that, and the other. And oh my God, you know what we call that? Context. White people in North America live in a social environment that protects and insulates them from race-based stress. This insulated environment of racial protection builds white expectations for racial comfort, while at the same time lowering the ability to tolerate racial stress. When it comes to thinking about white privilege, in regards to conversations about racism or race, we see that the comfort of white people is always what is prioritized. You know, uh, may my grandfather rest in peace, you feel me? He died when I was a senior in high school. But if that old black man was probably here and hearing me talk about white people to white people, the way I talk to white people about white people, he probably would be very, very nervous, you know? Was born in the 50s, Bryan, Texas. You know what I'm saying? We taught that we should always already have some type of understanding of white people's interpretation of our black words. It don't matter what we mean, it only matters how y'all gonna interpret my words. I ain't, I ain't with it. White fragility. Why is it so hard for white people to talk about race? If you're looking for a resource in this workshop in terms of something that you can build on some of the things or some of the seeds I'm planting in terms of this workshop, this book by Robin DiAngelo, Dr. Robin DiAngelo is a great book that will give you some confidence and some understanding about microaggressions, implicit bias, all those things when it comes to conversations about race and specifically the uniqueness of white people talking about race because there is a uniqueness. If it's unclear what I mean by white privilege, let me provide a definition and hopefully this clears it up and kind of gives some clarity. White fragility, that's what I mean, I think I said white privilege, I'm gonna say white fragility, you know. White fragility is the state of which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include outward display of emotions such as fear, guilt, behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. In my opinion, and I'm a debate coach too, you know what I'm saying? So if somebody wants that debate action, I got time, you feel me? In my, my, my perspective, when we say on the streets, Black Lives Matter, and people's response is all lives matter. This is a illustration of white fragility. This is a this is a literal illustration of racial stress that's becoming intolerable and it's triggering a defensive, a range of defensive moves. For you to say all lives matter. And want to argue about why we shouldn't say black lives matter, why we should say all lives matter. Why we should only say all lives matter. Let's keep it going though. When we say, when you say, Blue lives matter. And the people that say all lives matter isn't triggered by the specificity of blue life. This also is a illustration of white fragility. And don't mind, you feel me? Don't, don't worry, my, 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 my first year students, this is not an endorsement of liberalism. Let's be very clear. 
when it comes to white privilege, when it comes to racism, when it comes to white fragility, this is not something that only conservatives are implicated in. In this unconscious consciousness about racism, it is, I want you to be very clear. I want, I want to be very clear, I mean, that it is not a bipartisan issue. It is not a bipartisan issue. What do I mean by that, right? Unlearning racism is about power, right? See, when I first got into consciousness, I came across these people, you know what I'm saying, called the Black Panther Party. And I know a lot of people are kind of lost in a sauce of racial illiteracy, meaning that we are illiterate when it comes to situations to be able to read and write about race and racism, which means we are usually kind of mistaught or miseducated about, you know what I'm saying, things in regards to race. So a lot of people might think when I say Black Panthers that they're like the white KKK. Um, I would encourage you to go read about their Black Panther, I mean, read about their 10 party plan, read about their Rainbow Coalition. There's a movie coming out about the Black Panther Party and being able to show how both liberals and Democrats are implicated within this understanding about racism, right? But the reason why I'm bringing it up the Black Panthers right now is that it was one Black Panther by the name of Stokely Carmichael. He was also one of the co-founders of this uh, organization called SNCC that stands for the Student, non the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And Stokely Carmichael had this wonderful quote that I think perfectly illustrates what I mean about unlearning racism is about power, right? He said that if the white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. But if the white man has the power, the power to lynch me, that's my problem. When it comes to understanding race and racism, it is a conversation about power. And when I ask y'all to write your definition of racism at the beginning of this workshop, I'm curious of how many of y'all have the word power in that definition. To unlearn racism in this country requires us to check the question to white privilege. And any discussion of racism needs to include how the binary ideas of superiority and inferiority are used to construct racial designations in their, in their relations to power. And I apologize, somebody has sent something to the chat because I can't really see the chat right now when I'm on this, this, this thing. I'm gonna check it real fast. Uh, Paul, let me, I can't check it right here. Okay, man, with no, no questions right now. I, know, I feel like I'm moving kind of fast. So let's make sure we ain't got any questions. So what do I mean by this binary logic, you know? Like I said, my debate, I, got, I have a debate background. So I think that it's good for me to talk about this idea of how superiority and inferiority are used to construct racial designations in relationship to power with this understanding of binary logic. You know, shout out to uh, old Aristotle, you know what I'm saying? You know, the Western world structures itself according to the Aristotelian binary logic of opposition. Feel me? Hot is defined in opposition to cold. Up is defined in opposition to down. Woman is defined in opposition to man. Gay is defined in opposition to straight. These are all binary logics of opposition that Aristotelian logic, you know what I'm saying, kind of structures. The system of, this binary system of meaning, it works contextually by always placing any two terms as far as possible from one another. The white black binary, is what's kind of, man, what kind of, the white black binary is what is foundational to our understanding of, uh, of racism here in America. And not only here in America, but within the Western world. Because it literally works by placing positivity and establishing itself on the identity of the value of the white. And it structures its primary opposition and, neg and negativity on the level of the black. This is what a lot of us in the um, academic field know as anti-blackness. This is literally the structuring of white over black, light over dark. We know that there are seven continents in the world. We know that in all seven continents, there is a social order, a racial hierarchy of white over black, light over dark, even in continents like Africa. To speak of racial op op opposition, then is the reference of the anti-black world that principles to, these two principles, you know what I'm saying, dominate. That first, it is best to be white, and second, it is worse to be black. Or to put it in a multiculturalist terms, it is best to be white, and when that fails, at least avoid at all costs being black. What do I mean by that? Keep on going. Just add, add, some, add some context, you know? I think context is always important. Context is always important. 
What I know about the white black binary is that it tends to displace those other forms of racism, meaning racism operates outside of the white black binary. There are Mexican people that experience racism. There are, there are Asian people that experience racism. There are Native American people that experience racism. But it's something about this white black binary. I think one of the reasons is because of the, Ar the, Ar the Aristotelian binary logic that makes it where when we talk about race and racism, it tends to be filtered through a white black binary. But this is what Dr. Jerry Sexton says about the white black binary. It is neither dismantled nor suspended by the mere addition of other racialized groups. The traditional racialized groups in the United States are in descending order, whites, Asians, Native Americans, and blacks in the United States. Blacks and whites are in the binary opposition, even when the other racial groups are recognized since the American racial construct is a hierarchical scale with whites most value in the one, in, in the one end and blacks being the least valued on the other. Facts over feelings, man. Facts over feelings, right? We know that in America we have equal protection under law and that we're all supposed to be innocent to proven guilty and that we all get to have, you know, a trial by jury and we all get to have the right to a speedy trial. Think about within the racial hierarchy how these different sentiments of the law are suspended or expedited based off of one's race. Now, I've already told y'all, this conversation is not to be understood as just some liberal, democratic, mumbo-jumbo bullshit. It's not what we own. Liberals and Democrats are also implicated in the system power of racism. That's why we're having a conversation about power right now. When it comes to the legal parameters of being innocent to proven guilty and getting the right to trial by jury and all that there, right? When you think about the black people that are murdered in the streets, think about the suspension of the law when it comes to justifying their death. You didn't comply. It's whole ass amendments against harsh and unusual crime. How does white privilege, white fragility, and this conversation about racism and power go together? Two days ago, a white child, a five-year-old, was murdered in the state of North Carolina. His death is being weaponized and politicized against black people because they're saying, George, why are you not in outrage about this death? To me, it shows that we don't understand the difference between tragedy and injustice. This is a conversation about the unconscious consciousness of racism. It is a tragedy that Cannon's life was taken away. It is a tragedy any time a life is taken away, especially when a child's life is taken away. This tragedy should not be mistaken as an injustice. There has already been a mugshot produced for the killer of Cannon. Of Cannon. Cannon's family and his, 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 his uh, community did not have to march or rally or protest for justice to be taken. And this is my distinction between justice and tragedy. What is the orientation that the criminal justice system is taking towards this crime? Is it being treated with quickness and tenacity? Or are they dragging their feet trying to get any, any decision to justify the crime that was had? So with that being said, what the hell is racism? Is it about our feelings? Partly, but not really. Racism one-on-one. -on -one. When I say power, I'm talking about the access to resources and participation in society. Racism is prejudice plus power. When I say prejudice, I'm talking about beliefs, attitudes, actions based on stereotypes. Prejudice is also bad. However, with language, it's important to make distinctions. The reason why prejudice is not racism because one requires power. Do I think that the slaves on the plantation had prejudice against the slave master? Probably so. Do I think the Jews of the Holocaust had prejudice against the Nazi Germans? Yeah, probably so. Were they racist to them though? No. 
Racism equals racial prejudice plus institutional systemic power to dominate, exclude, discriminate against, abuse, targeted groups, or people based on race. This is why I want to be clear. White people, white people, listen up. This is why I want to be extremely clear. So I want to be extremely, extremely clear. Please listen to me with your undivided attention when I'm about to say it. Assholes come in all shapes, colors, and sizes. I'm sorry to say it that way. This is my second time I'm using a, introducing a new profanity cuss word into this workshop. I do mean that though. Assholes come in all shapes, colors, and sizes. What's my point? My point is the difference is when you have a system of power that can back you up or enforce you in being an asshole. Racism is about power. Institutional power, systemic power. And a lot of times when we have conversations about the unconscious consciousness of racism or have dialogue about racism, it is only boiled down to an individual understanding just about individuals. Not recognizing that it's not individuals that sustain racism, but it's the systems and institutions. All racists commit crimes. All racists commit crimes. However, we see that particular racists are disproportionately convicted and prosecuted for committing crimes. It's time we got. Got about 15 minutes, man. This is, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just gonna go over this uh, very briefly and I'm gonna get to this intersectionality and then I'm gonna get into some questions. So I'm, I'm opening up for questions. I'm gonna uh, take it off of this PowerPoint. Shout out to everybody on Patreon. Um, what we know about oppression, is that bringing up the you know Black Panther Party? One of my favorite quotes comes from Huey P. Newton. It's about power. He said that power is the ability to define the phenomenon and make it act then as our manner. Today, the phenomenon that we're getting into is the unconscious consciousness of racism. In order to define a phenomenon, you have to have language, you have to have understanding, you have to have a particular, I think, um, understanding to be able to identify and acknowledge what's going on, right? So when it comes to thinking about racial oppression, let's go a step further in being able to define this phenomenon. What type of racial oppression are we talking about? We got the four eyes of oppression. Are we talking about ideological oppression? Are we talking about interpersonal oppression or racism or ideological racism? Are we talking about internalized racism? Are we talking about institutional racism? When I say ideological, I'm talking about our thinking about specific groups. When I say interpersonal, I'm talking about how when we engage on the level of the individual, how phenomenons or predispositions about racism can manifest itself. This can be the example of the uh, white woman that clutches her purse as the black man enters the elevator. This can be name calling. This could be uh, verbal or nonverbal. It could even be abuse. Also, we got internalized. This is how people are able to internalize different inferior understandings of their particular race. That leads to things like self-harm, depression, drug abuse, alcoholism, low expectations, imposter syndrome. These things are different ways to understand racism, to be able to define the phenomenon, to make it act in a desired manner. And last, we got institutional. These are such as policies, laws, legislation, such as the criminal justice system, and specific or criminal justice policies that target specific groups. Example, example, stand your ground law or the Rockefeller law of the 1700s, of, of the 1970s, or um, uh, how the no notions of, of citizenship are weaponized against brown people and black people. Uh, we got a smooth way, man, to end this out, man. Let's see, man. So with, we're talking about those four eyes. I introduced another eye. The eyes, intersectionality. Um, you know, intersectionality is uh, just a, I feel like a nice term to talk about how different oppressions intersect with each other. So when I'm talking about the unconscious consciousness of racism, I want y'all to be thinking about how at the beginning of this workshop, I asked y'all about different demographics that also took into account things like gender and recognize that Intersectionality matters in terms of black women, Mexican women, black men, native men, all go through, all experience racism. However, based off of intersectionality, meaning their gender or their sexuality has an impact on how they are positioned by the system of race and racism. You know what I mean? And because this is in a higher education setting, you know, I'm just gonna read this little study. 
being a non-white student, being a non-white student at a predominantly white campus certainly doesn't guarantee a student will develop mental health issues. However, various studies suggest that perceived or actual discrimination can make it harder for a student of color to engage with the campus as their white peers do. So when we think about racism, we should not be, be, be thinking about this uh, issue devoid of things like mental health and thinking about how there are also people of color that experience different physical, uh, ph physiological, uh, 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 non-physical non uh, disabilities that also make it where they are positioned by racism a little bit differently. And there are also people that are impacted by racism that might bring about different particular, you know, mental health, you know, um, um, issues. So when we talk about racism, don't, th don't just think about it in terms of color. Think about it in terms of race. I mean, in terms of class, in terms of gender, in terms of ability. So intersectionality explained, you know, shout out to Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, intersectionality is a lens through which we can see where power comes and collides, where it intersects, where it intersects. It's not simply there's a problem here, a race problem here, a gender problem there, a class, an LGBT problem there. Many of the time, this framework erases how people that are subject to all these things live their lives. Right now, there's a phenomenon happening to black trans women, meaning black trans women are being uniquely targeted and murdered. Being black and trans, being subject to all those things adds uniqueness to how they experience their lives. Now, Audre Lorde, you know, if you're not familiar with Audre Lorde, she's somebody that has dedicated a lot of wonderful things to the literature base, talking about racism and white privilege and white supremacy and feminism and womanism and the woman identity. She said, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't live single issue lives. And then I'm gonna end this with, is that if you have through your time at the university, Rider State, um, any issues dealing with gender discrimination, maybe race, class, ability, gender, whatever, ethnicity, there are resources at Rider State University that y'all should be familiar with, like the Title IX Office, the Equal Opportunity Office, the Human Resource Department, um, different things like that to be able to try to help if a student or administration has done something or needs an issue, needs, work, needs help with dealing with something required in regards to race and racism. Um, I apologize because in, in my objective, Learning objective, I told y'all, y'all was gonna have some time to, uh, to, uh, to uh, think about strategies and procedures and methods specifically dealing with racism and how it, it operates on y'all you know, I mean, campus, especially when y'all was in high school. But uh, I got caught up and maybe one or two, one or two, two like lecturers that lasted a little too long and maybe the, uh, the uh, stereotypes workshop uh, activity kind of lasted a little too long too, so I didn't get, get into that. But, right, but now that I'm open up to uh, questions, uh, I shout out, shout out to y'all to uh, on Patreon. Appreciate y'all. Talk to y'all. Um, yeah, I'm open. I'm open up now for questions. Um, I know that kind of maybe ended a little, 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 little awkward, but I know y'all gotta leave here in a few, uh, here in a little bit. I know I've said a lot. Um, questions, comments, concerns. Yeah, usually that workshop is about three hours. I just tried to dig it and have a long y'all just gave me. So yeah. We have a, a question. Um, so in our uh, college everyday life, some occasionally we come across maybe a, a peer or, or someone close to us who is um, kind of showing maybe a racial bias or some sort of racist ideologies. How do you go? How do you recommend going about handling that? in a, a non-confrontational, non maybe less accusatory way? Um, I mean, it's kind of twofold. On one instance, I recognize in terms of education that you're not gonna be able to really teach someone something or change someone's mind if you're, if you're coming off as being attacking them or if you're coming off as targeting them. But I do recognize on the other end is that when we try to be kind of nice about calling people out about being, you know, not nice. It's kind of like a like a like a like a regressive uh, story. I mean, a regressive um, a, a cycle. Uh, what I will say is that when it comes to implicit bias and microaggressions, I think that being able to get an individual to 
um, c come to grips with what they're seeing and what they're doing on their own by asking them questions. I think that's usually the, 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 the better method, a better way to get somebody to understand how they're being racist, how they're being sexist, how they're being problematic in whatever instance. Um, I do recognize that sometimes people are invested in um, being, you know, sympathetic to racial, uh, uh, to racist ideologies, and things like that. And sometimes you have to make the decision to sacrifice, I mean, uh, preserve your own mental health and say, well, who cares? You're right. That person is, they, 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 they invested to, you know, if that answers your question, but yeah. Individuals being racist, how do you help those individuals? How can you bring it to them? Um, try to present them with information, but cognitive distance is real. But I would start with trying to present, present them with some information. Good question too, definitely good question. Well, George, I know that people have questions. They may not be jumping in with them. Uh, but the good thing is we've got scheduled, I think some small group time so that uh, the activity you didn't get to, people talking about, uh, maybe the ways these things manifest themselves on the campus that they're at and, you know, ways that we could kind of improve that situation are, are uh, maybe some areas of discussion that they can get into after this conversation. But I just want to uh, take a moment to say thank you for doing this presentation. Um, I know that you and I have had a lot of conversations around these topics and, um, and I know it's not a one shot deal. I think that, um, a goal that I have for, for our students at, at Rogers State is that uh, we continue this conversation and that we engage in discussion that makes us uncomfortable. We ask those critical questions and that we try to engage with people who are gonna be different from us and have different perspectives. And to people's point about, you know, what do you do when you're, you know, you got some, uh, somebody who's just espousing racist viewpoints or sexist viewpoints or something, I mean, you're gonna experience that in your time at college. And I think one thing that we all need to get better at is not avoiding these conversations um, and just uh, you know, steering away from them. I think we need to become more comfortable in that zone of discomfort. Uh, and that only happens when we uh, become better rehearsed at, we become better practiced. I think a lot of the things that you introduced today, George, will help people start to build a vocabulary uh, for talking about these things, help contextualize and maybe frame some of these issues so that they can feel more confident to engage in that discussion. And maybe not, maybe it just plants a seed and maybe they uh, now wanna do some reading uh, or do some more private reflection on some of these topics. And I think all of those are great outcomes, uh, but I'm really excited that we're gonna try to bring you back this fall uh, to do some more programming, keep the conversation going. And so uh, I have a feeling that uh, uh, we'll have more questions then too. Uh, but with that, I wanna say thank you and I'll probably end our recording um, from there. Uh, and then if anyone has any final questions for George or anything y'all wanna say to him, we can do that before we conclude the meeting.